let's dive in. Uh, so what's our agenda? So first, when we're talking about healthcare pricing, um, there are a whole bunch of different things it can be, and one of them is the price transparency rule for hospitals. And I am going to talk about that. I'm going to do it at the end, um, partially because it only applies to hospitals, and we have a bunch of clinics on, and the clinics don't – I mean, they may be curious about it, but it doesn't apply to clinics. You could probably do an hour on that. I don't know. I haven't tried. Um, but I'm not going to. It's going to be about 10 minutes at the end, so hopefully that won't be a, a disappointment. Um, if it is, well, we'll give you your money back. Um, so what we're really going to focus on are general principles that apply to pricing. And a lot of this is theoretical because I think if you think about this the right way, uh, it, it just helps you answer all of the questions if you sort of get to a bigger picture of how pricing works. So we'll talk about some of the Medicare-specific rules, a little bit about antitrust, um, and then just the problems that pop up with inconsistent pricing. So. Many of you know I like storm ch chasing. You will tell this is not a recent picture. Well, you will tell it if I advance the slides the right way. Um, so that is from Foster, Wisconsin, which is near Eau Claire. Holy cow, look at the gas prices. Um, and I was out chasing and stumbled upon that tornado. Um, uh, so it's really more of a price thought. You know, life is interesting. Gary Larson sums up things so well. Uh, Price is a weird psychological thing, right? I am guilty of often assuming that the higher priced item is better. In the case of Don's discount shark cages, it apparently was. Um, but pricing is a weird psychological thing for us because um, people don't like the cheap, but they also don't want to feel like they've overpaid. And all of that gets wrapped up in the weird mix of healthcare pricing. But let's think about the law for a moment. So generally, when you buy something, you know what it's going to cost, right? Um, you might bargain over it. There might be some bartering. You know, if you're buying a house, you might go back and forth on the price. But you know this is the set price. Um, whether it's you know, going to college, you're picking up milk in the store, almost always there's an explicit agreement on the price. But that isn't always true. And the in addition to healthcare, the other big exception I can think of is if you walk into a restaurant or when you could walk into a restaurant and you ordered the special, they may come in and say, oh, we've got the great salmon for you. It's, a, it's an excellent fish. Um, and they don't tell you how much it costs. And you order it and it comes and you get the bill and the bill is $200. And you're like, what the heck just happened? Well, if you were to go to court to fight on that, the way the court would look at this is it would say, since there was no explicit agreement on price, there's an implied contract between the parties. And we are going to look at what common sense says um, the price should be. And it has to be reasonable, right? The restaurant can't charge you more than you reasonably expected to pay, and you can't pay more than or less than a reasonable amount. And they're going to try to look at evidence to figure out what that would be. So what kind of facts would they consider? Well, they might consider what other restaurants do. They might consider the cost of the fish. They might consider other things on the menu. All of that's going to go in, and, but there's no absolute certainty, right? A court's going to impose its judgment on everyone. And implied contracts are not a normal thing. So it's, there isn't a ton of case law about it, and healthcare is probably the part of the economy where this happens the most, all right? And so it's really weird, and it's uh, therefore a bit unpredictable. Um, so... You know, we've seen this happen. I, when I was a baby lawyer, we had litigation where a health insurer came into one of our clients and they said, we've gathered all of this data. You're above the 80th percentile. And since you're above the 80th percentile, we're not going to, we will pay up to the 80th percentile. Anything above is unreasonable. We're not going to pay. So they didn't pay. We sued them. We went into court. And what wound up happening were two things. First, the court said, sorry, you can't say anything above the 80th percentile is unreasonable. 20% of the market is there. So that, you, you can't do that as a matter of law insurance company. But in the course of the litigation, we discovered something else, which was the insurer, this was a, we had a radiology client, and the insurer was comparing our global charge to a bunch of technical only data. Um, and in fact, they didn't understand what a TC and a PC were or what that little dash 26 meant on claims. And so they lumped everyone together and 
you can imagine, yes, my globally billing radiology client was above the norm compared to technical only. A couple of lessons from this. One, don't trust whatever the insurer tells you is an automatically accurate thing. Uh, and two, be willing to fight on usual and customary type things, especially if someone is assigning them or is capping things at a particular threshold. The restaurant example is where I think about hamburger is someone cannot walk into a steak joint and say, hey, I can get a burger for a buck at McDonald's. I am only paying you a dollar. That doesn't work, right? You have to take into account the totality of the circumstances and you can't um, automatically impose prices uh, on one good just because there's a similar price on another good. Now that said, um, we, I, Mike Reiling, when he was alive, used to use a term, uh, the terminal uniqueness. And he would say, some doctors suffer from terminal uniqueness, thinking that only they can do a particular thing and that they're you know, special and different than everyone else. And you do have to be wary of thinking that your service is so good, it can be charged in a way that no one else can charge. All right, a few editorial comments. I don't think that pricing is the highlight of the healthcare industry. And if you were to ask me, and I'm kind of curious if anyone wants to comment on this in the, uh, uh, in the chat box, you can. What industry is most like healthcare pricing, or is most like healthcare when it comes to pricing? I have a strong opinion that I will give you in a moment. Um, I think one of the things that really louses us up are contracts that pay based on a percentage of billed charges in situations where we're trying to have a significant percentage discount. Like if someone wants to pay 95% of billed charges, I don't think that's a big problem. I think that works really well. The problem is 60% of billed charges or 50% of billed charges because it means that the billed charge is really functionally meaningless. A little 5% here and there, that doesn't matter to anyone. But 50% matters a lot and it undercuts the reality of the bill, and it's a lot of what confuses everyone. So my answer on the industry front is I would say health uh, healthcare pricing is a lot like airlines, right? Um, it's sort of random, different people pay different prices, not everyone knows what everyone else is paying, and when you find out what it is, you get annoyed. Um, I just saw someone pop in auto sales, and there's a, I would have to agree that that one's not a bad choice either. Um, so, the contract matters for this stuff, and contracts are going to do things in different ways, and we'll talk about the, the ways that they can set prices in a couple of slides. Um, but if you can avoid big discounts off of your build charges, I think that's a good idea. And I don't mean that in the business sense of not having the discount, but in the intellectual sense, it's going to avoid a lot of the problems that we're going to talk about in a moment. So do you have to post your price? So Generally, at this point, there is not an explicit requirement that you do so, but there are a few major exceptions. First, um, COVID-19 testing must be posted. That was part of, I want to say, the CARES Act, but it might have even been the one before, the family's first, I don't know. One of the acts includes an explicit requirement that you do, that you post the, the, uh, the cash price you will accept for COVID testing. And then it requires insurers that you don't contract with to pay that price. I have to say, I'm kind of impressed with that stylistically. I think that's a, a smart way of handling some of this. Um, when yesterday I saw an email come out that said price transparency in it. And I thought, oh, wow, an announcement is coming about the hospital price transparency rule. But it was, in fact, CMS telling us about that COVID testing thing, which they're calling price transparency. On the one hand, that is accurate. On the other, it's terribly misleading because there's a whole price transparency rule coming down, and I felt like it was bait and switch. I think it is important to link the two in the following way. It is clear that healthcare price, pricing transparency is a policy that Democrats and Republicans can agree on. Heck, I think it's a good idea. Um, I don't know that that made me sound like maybe I guess I'm an independent. I don't know. But it seems like it's it's a good matter of policy, and I have to think it's going to happen. So I think we're going to have to be prepared for it. I don't predict the future much, but I will predict that, we're, that this is an area that's going to get scrutiny. You have to know your state law. Um, some states require you to provide a good faith estimate to patients. Um, there are some states that will have a little bit of requirements of posting 
They're not out there commonly yet, but it's happening more and more. Just yesterday, Minnesota passed a drug pricing uh, transparency provision, or it was signed, I guess, yesterday. Um, so even if you aren't required to do it, remember, it does two things for you. First, it helps, getting, it helps avoid patients being mad because they're surprised. And second, if you, it lowers the odds that you wind up in one of these implied contract fights, right? Because the patient will know what's going on. So there are distinct advantages to publicly stating your price. So here's a question that I think people get wrong a lot. Can I have different prices for different patients? And I think the conventional wisdom is no, and it comes from the basic idea that it is illegal to discriminate. It is not illegal to discriminate. Not only is it legal to discriminate, it's stupid not to discriminate. I hope when it comes to hiring lawyers, you discriminate. Don't hire any lawyer, hire a good one, right? Ideally, one who is smart and cheap. Um, and so it is okay to discriminate. You just can't do it for an illegal reason. And so far, it is permissible to have different prices for different people. In fact, I would assert everyone on this call does. And some of you are like, no, we send everyone this, a bill for the same amount. And that's an argument. Here's a really interesting question that's going to run through this whole webinar. If you send a patient a bill that says it's uh, for $100, and you know that that insurer is going to pay you $90, and you're going to take the $90 as payment in full and close your account, have you billed them $100 or have you billed them $90? And I understand the argument that the amount on the claim is the amount that you billed them. That's a cogent argument. But I could make a pretty compelling counter argument that that wasn't really the bill because you never expected to see it and you weren't going to put them in collection when they paid you 90. You knew that a $90 check was coming your way and that $100 was really a sham, right? That is not a crazy argument to make. And that's the root of a lot of the disputes that come up in the pricing thing is this difference between the number or the figure that appears on the claim and the amount you actually expect to get paid. And which is your charge? Well, to the extent we have laws defining it, there isn't anything that specifies the answer to that question. And so that, if you understand that, you understand a lot of why we're going to fight about this stuff. So inconsistent pricing isn't going to be illegal in the sense that you're going to go to jail for it or that it explicitly violates the statute, but it's going to allow people to argue that they're entitled to pay less than you think that they should because someone else paid less. And we'll talk about that at some length. Um, I am not an antitrust expert. We've got uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Adam Miller, who does that. I know a little enough to be dangerous. So there's robinson patman which is a provision that prohibits price discrimination for goods. So you, their discrimination is illegal for a, a good. And so distinguish between a good, a tangible item, and a service, like healthcare services. You aren't supposed to with some exceptions, have different prices for goods, um, you can for services. And we get into nuance there that are above my pay grade. So if a patient can come in off the street and get a 10% discount off of your bill charge, one of the questions is, why doesn't an auto insurer or a um, indemnity insurer or someone else get that same discount? And people can come up with various explanations. They'll say things like, well, we don't have to bill the patient if they pay right out of the bat. And some of those arguments have some merit, but all of them can be attacked. And so that, the, the problem, as soon as you start to offer a discount to a cash paying person, a bunch of other payers that you don't con contract with are gonna say, wait a minute, your actual charge is now the amount that that cash paying customer pays and I um, am entitled to that same, that same discount. And if not, you're you know, defrauding me is one argument they're going to say, or at least overcharging me, all right? Um, if you say, well, I'm charging, uh, I'm offering this discount because I don't have to generate a bill, something to keep in mind, many of your contracts say you can't charge a fee for generating bills. That's common in Blue, Shield, Blue Cross Blue Shield contracts, right? Um, you may, uh, so, so you have to know if you're giving, if you come up with a reason for the discount, does that reason run afoul of what's already in your agreements? 
So here's something that I'm surprised it, this doesn't come up more. Um, but can I charge different rates for different physicians? So this is common in the legal industry. It's probably not totally rational. My hourly rate is generally going to be higher than someone less senior than me. There can be exceptions, um, but that's sort of generally speaking for us lawyers, we increase our hourly rates as we get more senior. The theory being that we can do things faster. Lord knows if that's true, that's the theory. Don't see that as much in the medical world. Um, and I would say, by the way, I would posit that there are people who are less senior to me who are far superior to me, but that may just be my poor ego. Um, you don't see this in the healthcare world, could you? I think you can. Um, you certainly don't have to, but I, I think it would be defensible. Now, what would it mean? Like, if, if someone asks your usual and customary charge, is it by code or is it by professional? And there isn't a clear answer to that. Um, I think when you're billing as a group, it's probably logical to think of it as by code, but there's amazingly little thought about this, right? Could you have two doctors? And, I, and here's an interesting question. Who should charge more, the young one or the old one, right? Is it closer to medical school a, a skill or a, is experience the skill? I don't know. Um, so there's going to be a lot of I don't knows here. People also assume they have to give Medicare their lowest price. That is completely wrong. Uh, it's counterintuitive. People think generally that you can't charge the government more than you charge others. But Medicare says that they will pay you the lower of three things, the amount you actually charge, so the thing that's on your bill or the amount you collect to pay, we don't know, as we've talked about before, the amount that they'll pay you on the fee schedule, or your usual and customary charge. And your usual and customary charge is not defined in a regulation. And if you're a frequent listener to our webinars, you know regulations are way more authoritative than manuals. But According to the manual, your usual and customary charge is your median charge. That's the charge where half of the people are paying more and half of the people are paying less. Um, and so to, to, to uh, have a real world example, if you had a service and one person paid you 20, one person paid you 25, uh, two people paid you 30, someone paid you 50, and someone paid you 100, the the price that's at the middle is 30. That is not the average. If you added those all together and averaged them, it's going to be a much higher number. But it's the point where half are paying more and half are paying less. Now, what about Medicaid? Do you have to give them their lowest price? Well, that's totally a state law question. And since we've got people in here, I think possibly from all 50 states today, I, I'm not going to try to answer that. They're all over the board. You know, Iowa historically followed Medicare on most of this stuff. Minnesota did a really odd thing, they used your mode, the most common charge. So in the example I gave before where there were two patients who were doing the 30 bucks, that was the most common and so it would have been both the median and the mode. Um, I so want to make an a la mode joke there. Um, but you got to know what your state does. Can you require a patient to pay more than their insurance pays? And this is going to vary payer to payer. So first, do you have a contract with the payer? If you have a contract with the payer, that controls. And I sort of skipped over a slide earlier that says you got to read those silly little contracts. You got to read those silly little contracts. Uh, and it's a, it's a pain in the butt. Um, but uh, some of them will tell you, m many of them will limit your ability to pay or to charge a patient more than the allowed amount. In fact, I would say that's almost universal. So if, it, if it's a covered service, your reimbursement is capped at the amount the insurer will pay. Now, if you don't have a contract with them, it's sort of Katie bar the door and you can, you can do whatever you want with this implied contract limitation of you can't make an unreasonable charge to someone. But you, um, you aren't capped if a insurer says we're only going to pay $100 for this office visit and your charge is $150, you generally are going to be permitted to go after the patient for that extra buck money. And in fact, in some situations, your refusal to go after the patient for the difference may generate trouble. Um, so how can that be the case? Well, if we've got one of the contracts that's paying off of a percentage of your billed charge, and let's say they're paying two-thirds of your bill charge, and your charge is $150, and that's why they're paying $100. If you don't collect the balance from the patient, 
the insurer can say, wait a sec, we're only responsible to pay two thirds of the bill. If you're not going to make the patient pay their third, we're only responsible for two thirds of a hundred dollars. We only have to pay you 66. And that sort of goes on indefinitely. And that's why there's a big difference um, based on how fees are set up. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so if, uh, if the payer is Medicare, if you're participating in Medicare, you have to accept the Medicare amount. If you're non-participating, then there's a, something called a limiting charge, which, which lets you collect an extra 15% from the patient, but that's it. But you have to pay attention to state law, because like Minnesota, for example, passed a law back in the early 90s that said if you're in Minnesota, you, uh, even if you uh, um, are not participating, you're capped at the limiting charge. Uh, if you opt out, you can basically do what you want because you're not governed by any of this Medicare stuff. Um, you're going to be governed by plain old contract law, so that op option exists. Medicaid is going to vary state by state. So can you charge a patient extra for something like a phone call? Well, this is again a payer by payer question. Medicare, now this is changing a lot. The COVID public health emergency has changed it because it used to, there used to be very limited telehealth slash telephone coverage. Just always remember telehealth is audio visual, telephone audio only. Uh, and there was little coverage for both. Um, but even in the old days, telephone calls were covered. They just weren't separately reimbursable. Now they are separately reimbursable, which makes this even it's more easily understood. You can't charge a Medicare patient for a covered service. So in the old days, phone calls were covered but not reimbursed. Now they're covered and reimbursed. Can't charge a patient for them. Most insurers will say if they cover something, you can't bill for it. That's going to be pretty common. Absent a contract, you can probably charge someone. And so like, for example, in concierge practices, often what you'll see is exorbitant charges for coffee. That's legal. So uh, time for our first pr contest. Um, actually, uh, yeah, uh, so there's a reference here to Mirror. There is an 80s group uh, that had a song called The Mirror Man. Uh, name that group. So uh, the song again is Mirror Man. First person with that one will win a prize. So can you adjust your fees to out of network patients to mirror the network? And this is a super controversial issue and one where I don't feel like I can give a definitive answer. But I will tell you um, you know, what some of the insurers think, right? They, as a matter of policy, they want their network to mean something. They want to be able to say that by putting a pay, uh, practice in network, uh, they can drive patients to the, uh, they can drive patients to the particular organization. Uh, and since we have a winner, uh, well, uh, uh, well uh, we have a winner on that one. So you can stop sitting in your things and I will, uh, t t tomorrow when you get, I will, Put the answers to all of the contests in our email that comes with the slides tomorrow, so we'll have answers. Um, so insurers want the network to mean something, and so they will uh, they, they want their additional reimbursement and their discounts to be meaningful and will want to enforce the contract, right? There's a weird situation, which is the contract is if it exists, is between you and the insurance company. Um, if there's no contract between you and the insurance company, there's still a contract between the patient and the insurer. And the terms of that contract are going to drive a lot of what's going on. And so this may be the most important slide we're going to talk about, right? Some insurers pay off of a fee schedule. Some pay off of a percentage of charges. And some will pay a percentage of the fee schedule. And that difference is huge because if the insurer is going to pay two thirds of whatever the patient is responsible for paying, if you give a discount to the patient, the insurer by the terms of its contract should get the discount. And so taking a step back and thinking of this from a legal standpoint, insurers stand in the shoes of the patient. Um, that's, that's the duty 
of the insurer to pay is because they are indemnifying or covering the costs that the insured has to pay. When they stand in those shoes, they would be entitled to any break you give to the patient. And that's the argument insurance companies make. If you say, we're not going to hold the beneficiary responsible, if you say, I, we, we're, um, patient doesn't have to pay anything more than the insurer pays, the insurer will say, if the patient isn't responsible, we're not responsible. And there are cases that come out that way. Um, and so that's a very real issue. And that's one of the biggest problems with the adjustment. If the insurer says, we will pay X dollars for this service, that gets rid of this problem to some extent. So fee schedules are better than percentage of billed charges for avoiding this in-network, out-of-network problem. Now, there are two big cases that I know of on this topic. One out of New Jersey, it's pretty old, um, it's 11 years old, where a New Jersey ASC was adjusting, adjusting its uh, rate, waiving copays. And the insurer, HealthNet, was upset by this um, and they pointed to a state law that forbid dentists from waiving a coinsurance, and the court said, we're going to still let the ASC do that, and we're going to let them treat out-of-network patients as in-network. But there is a counter case. Um, it's, it's more recent, although that isn't, the test here isn't old versus new. It's kind of two ways of looking at things. Um, it's North Cyprus Medical Center, which I always assume is in California. It is not. It was near Dallas in Texas. Uh, and they had a big fight with Cigna because they were giving discounts to out-of-network patients. And Cigna said, if you give that discount, we share it too. Um, you need to give us the same discount exactly you give the patient. And there the court said, yep, that is true. I worry that that latter one will carry the day. I think that those arguments, the arguments made by Cigna make a lot of sense. Um, all right. Are there limits on how much I can raise my prices? Federally, there are not. State law may apply. Something to just put in the back of your mind. Antitrust law says that if you raise your prices by 5% or more, that's sort of suggestive of a monopoly. And let's do just a quick little walk down the antitrust road. So antitrust is a, is a complicated law that, uh, that supports the idea of competition, right? And we don't know in healthcare, whether we want competition or not. There's this competing idea, competition lowers prices in most things, but sometimes we think competition in healthcare increases prices by increasing redundancy. That's a conversation for another day, but it's out there. Antitrust law generally is biased in favor of buyers, and it's very policy driven. It's less legal and more policy. Um, so here's a question people ask a lot. Can you know a competitor's charge, right? Can you? call up a competitor and say, hey, what would you charge for a, uh, a 99213? And I, I didn't put the stuff on here because I kind of want people to think about that for a second. I'm curious as to what you think the answer is. Well, the answer is, of course you can. And this isn't one where people's immediate reaction is often inconsistent with the law, right? Target knows what Walmart charges and vice versa. It isn't illegal to know what someone else charges. What is illegal is to agree on a, on a charge. And so if you're a student on this stuff, you might know that, for example, on salary surveys, companies will often have a third party and they will share the information. So why do they do that if it's not illegal to just gather it yourselves? Well, knowing the information may make it more likely that people either agree or act like they've agreed. And the courts will allow, um, will allow an agreement to be deduced through people's conduct, right? So if everyone follows everyone else, they may think there's an agreement. Now, that's not always true in the airline industry. It's called conscious parallelism, right? So Delta lowers its prices and American and United does the same, but they haven't agreed. They're just following each other. If they do it on their own, that's legal. But if they have a meeting and they go, hey, we're going to lower our prices to X, why don't you not go below wink, wink, nudge, nudge? That's enough to be the agreement. Um, and that can be an antitrust problem. So I could turn this into a quick lesson on antitrust. I will just mention a couple of terms and define them quickly. It is always good to remember that in the antitrust world, there are kind of two things to think about, the product market and the geographic market. So the product market is what are you selling? So who else can provide this thing? So in the world for orthopedic services, you know, I have some people sometimes ask, well, is a chiropractor a competitor of an orthopedic surgeon? Well, they can't do orthopedic surgery, right? So they probably aren't. 
Um, is a podiatrist a competitor? Well, on foot type things, yes. Uh, on hand things, no. And so there's a product market and then there's a geographic market, which is how far people will go. Um, and a story I often talk about is out of it's a case involving cardiac surgery in Nebraska. The court said for specialty care, people will drive like an hour. And so they determined Lincoln and Omaha, 56 miles apart, were the same part of the geographic market. Now that's going to depend, right? For primary care, people probably aren't going to go as far. And obviously mileage is going to matter. An hour in New York City is not the same as an hour in Nebraska. So price fixing is special and it's specially bad. Often you need market power to get in trouble on an antitrust claim. Um, so for example, you, to be a monopolist, you have to be big, right? You need market power. Price fixing is what's called a per se violation and size doesn't matter. The two smallest people in the market, if they agree on a price, that's still a felony and you can go to jail. And so if two doctors and a, two solo practitioners on the golf course agree on how they're going to handle um, their negotiations with Blue Cross Blue Shield, that can send them both away. Um, similarly, boycott is kind of the same thing. So this New Yorker cartoon sums it up well. You know, if you, so if you said, quit taking insurance, pass it on, that's probably legal. But if you said, quit taking Blue Cross Blue Shield, that is not. So um, I'm just going to skip that slide, I think, for the moment. So um, generally re requires uh, agreement between competitors, but not monopolization. Um, we've already talked about conscious parallelism. So the way this comes up, you know, if you're negotiating with an insurer, two clinics that negotiate jointly, that's a potential problem. Um, and even negotiating with a hospital or uh, other things. So these are the ways in which antitrust can come up. Um, one of the solutions to this is a merger. So if two groups get together in what's called a divisional merger, if you're one entity under uh, antitrust law, a, an or, a, a corporation can't conspire with itself. So if two clinics merge or two hospitals merge, they can negotiate jointly, even if they have separate divisions and they sort of operate more or less the same if they're one corporate entity, that's generally going to be enough to negotiate together. So can people unilaterally say no as part of a negotiation? Yes. Could you unionize? Well, doctors can unionize, but they need to do it against an employer. So you can't like clinics or hospitals can't unionize against insurance companies. It's not feasible because you can only unionize against the employer. Um, uh, you can't agree to refuse to sign a contract. You can get big. And actually in the clinic world right, world right now, I am not very worried about mergers getting too big because right now um, there's so much integration that if you're an individual, if you're physicians and you're not part of a system, I think the odds of you getting an antitrust problems are very low. I think that the people who are going to get picked on right now are the systems. It's not an absolute take it to the bank, but it's pretty close. Um, so if you're in, if you're in a group and you're worried right now, consider a divisional merger. Um, and that's the sort of thing we help people with all the time. Okay, back to pricing. Can uh, you give a prompt pay discount? Uh, so this is one where the legal and the practical answers are a little bit different. So if you offer a prompt pay discount, it allows someone to say, well, let's, let's make it operational. If I say to someone, you, uh, you pay me today, it's 100 bucks, or I charge 100 bucks, but if you pay today, you can pay $90. Another way of saying that is I will take $90 today. If you pay tomorrow, it's $100. Well, that's a problem because it's usurious interest. And so if you charge usurious interest, you're violating a host of laws. And it is possible to argue cash discounts are inflated interest charges. When I was a baby lawyer back in the 90s, there were lawyers who would write demand letters on this very topic. I have not seen that really much since then. Um, there was a, it, it, if, if lawyers do write those letters, you can in theory get attorney's fees, and you know, the actual damages are nothing. Practically speaking, why do I love my dentist? Because I like that cash discount. Do I take advantage of it? Darn straight. What would I do if I were in your shoes? I'd probably offer that discount and take the risk. And if a person didn't have their checkbook with them that day, I would not be a stickler on it. I would say, yeah, bring your checkbook and we'll give you the cash discount. Now, am I telling you that this is okay? I am not. I think that someone can write this letter and still say, hey, you're charging a usurious rate. Um, and there's even a little bit of a risk that the 
payers argue that they're entitled to the same thing. Um, dentists probably have it easier because fewer people have dental insurance, and so it's less likely an insurer is going to squeak. Um, but that's, that's sort of the legal framework on this. Can you collect your fees up front? So generally, it's not Generally, you can. You're, even most of your contracts aren't going to prohibit it, as long as you make sure you're not collecting from the patient more than they are responsible for paying. If you were to say to the patient, you know, you've got an 80-20 plan, we're going to collect the whole thing from you, and then we'll re refund the 80% when your insurer pays, that will run afoul of potentially of the contracts. Um, and I always worry about situations where you're creating credit balances because you need to make sure you're paying those back to people. But it's also hard to chase people for money. Um, I know as a patient, I hate it when I get the bills after. I would much rather pay at the time of service. Um, it's just hard to keep track of it. So, so yes, you can collect them up front. Do you have to refund all credit balances? Well, that is what would you want? Um, my childhood pediatrician, I discovered when I was an adult and doing work for them, uh, had a policy that they would offer a return on a credit balance if A, it exceeded $500, and B, the person asked. In other words, if they owed my family $400 and we didn't ask, they were going to keep it. Well, that doesn't sound so good to me, right? Um, and there are, there are some state laws. First of all, um, if you've got unclaimed property, most states require you to either try to get it back to the person or turn it over to the state right? Um, and certainly, it's going to be bad on TV on this thing. So my answer is try to refund credit balances with one thing. I'm, I'm comfortable with one exception to that. I am comfortable if your refund policy and your billing policy are identical. If you would say, we won't bill a patient who owes us $10 and we will refund and we won't, let's, let me rephrase that. If you owe us less than 10 bucks, we won't bill you. And if we owe you less than 10 bucks, we won't refund it. So there's symmetry in there. I cannot point to a statute that backs that up. I just point to sort of common sense and how mad is anyone going to get. Uh, I once got a bill for 18 cents for a lab test. That was really dumb that the, or, that the organization that sent that to me spending more on the postage than the bill. Um, I don't want to get those bills. You don't want to get those bills. I don't want to get a check for 18 cents, right? And I think no matter how poor you are, a check for 18 cents probably isn't the thing you're really looking for. Um, but as the numbers creep up, there are, you know, $10 matters to some people. And so you got to be sensitive to this. Um, but consistency, I think, is what's going to keep you out of trouble. Can you charge patients who don't show? Well, it's a payer-specific question. Here's a crazy one. Medicare lets you do it. You can charge Medicare patients that no show. Um, and uh, well, well, I'll have the MLN on this in a moment, but their theory is you can charge Medicare for lost business opportunities. Private payers, you need to know. Medicaid, it depends on the state. I will say if you're going to do this, I would let people know because we're back to the implied contract thing. Uh, you can make people mad. And, and you may not want to do it. I mean, so for example, if you're charging people who are no-shows, if someone thinks that they have COVID-19, they're more likely to come in. Um, because they don't want to be a no-show, right? And so be aware of the collateral consequences of possibly having this policy. Um, but can you do it? For Medicare, yes, and often you, often you can. I would make sure you're notifying people ahead of time. Can you waive co-payments? I got a ton of slides here. We're going to go really quickly through this because I want to leave time to do the price transparency stuff. So there are two different laws. And I am often guilty of focusing on the anti-kickback statute more than the civil monetary penalty provision law. Um, waiving co-pays is often trouble under both of those laws, state laws, and there's a great case to read that describes the problem. Um, uh, it was a chiropractor who advertised, come here, I won't charge you your co-pay. And the court explains the whole point of the insurer was responsible to pay 80% of the charge if you're giving if the, if the patient doesn't have to pay their share, you take 80% of the smaller amount. So if you were starting at 100 bucks, it goes down to 80, then it goes down to 64, and it just keeps going down ad infinitum. Uh, and so it, any discount shared, we've kind of talked about that concept, that case explains it well. Um, the anti-kickback statute is intent-based, so it will look at why are you waiving the copay. And so if you're doing it um, because the patient is poor, for example, that's not going to be a kickback problem. The civil monetary penalty provision is similar, 
but instead it uses a know or should know that it's likely to influence the beneficiary's selection of a provider. Similar, but not identical to the anti-kickback statute. Um, you got to know your state laws. You know, they don't always follow the federal laws. Most of your insurance contracts are going to do it. Now, can you waive copays for the poor? I would say yes. If someone's uninsured, I'm just not worried about it. Um, I don't think there are a bunch of cases about this. There was a situation when Congress did an investigation back in 2000. The American Hospital Association suggested hospitals were skeptical of giving discounts to the poor because of the anti-kickback statute. Um, and I rolled my eyes at that one because if people don't have insurance, the anti-kickback statute doesn't apply. It only applies to people with insurance. Um, well, not even with insurance, but to Medicare or Medicaid, right? So if you're uninsured, not an issue. Um, can you write off a copay for the angry? I would say I, I feel very comfortable with that. Um, I see ways it can be attacked, but if the patient has been hurt, what I would argue is you're really, in essence, settling a dispute with the patient and the insurer doesn't, they're not a party to that dispute. And so what you're giving the patient isn't something to which the insurer is entitled. Can you give free care to employees? Well, yes, but it has all kinds of interesting collateral consequences. Um, I rec generally recommend not doing it because, for example, if you're doing it totally free, you're giving a huge discount to the insurer to give a small discount to your employee. So that seems like it's just not a good business decision. And if you're doing insurance only with the uh, employee, we're back to the, well, it's fine if the insurer doesn't matter, but if the insurer wants to squeak, we're right back to the patient isn't liable, insurer isn't liable problem. Um, there also can be some benefit plan issues. And I'm not the top expert on this. Deb Linder, my colleague, knows a bit more. But there was a case involving Emory University a decade or two ago um, where they got in trouble for this, for basically violating some employee benefit laws. Uh, and you can kind of see how this is because it, 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 it is of differential value to different people in the organization. Um, also, it gives patients an incentive to see you, which can be good. I mean, you, you want your employees to come to you on some level to feel like they can trust you, but it also can create a uh, employment issues when you get someone who's come to you for a medical condition, if they get fired and then claim you were firing them because you knew of this medical condition. I don't know. All in all, for all of these reasons, I'm not a giant fan of the discounts to the employees. What I would do instead is take the money you get from their co-pays and stuff and throw it into some fund that you use to throw a party for people. But that's sort of personal opinion. Can you give free care to doctors? I have too many slides about this, but I'm just going to say the anti-kickback question is why are you doing it? So if you write, don't charge him, he's a good referral source, as one of our clients did once, that's a big old problem. Um, if you do it universally for all medical professionals, um, that's probably not a kickback problem. And it's, if, if you comply with stress, so if you're a hospital or, or if you're doing designated health services ordered by the people who are, you're getting these discounts, you have to worry about Stark. Um, if you are a clinic and you don't do designated health services for people, you don't. If you're a hospital, you by definition, you know, any of these people, if they admit to you, you'll have to worry about it. And then you have to, to worry about the Stark uh, so these are, that's the list of designated health services. You've got to meet the Stark exception. It's lengthy, and I'm not going to go into it at length. It's right here. Um, can you give discounts to the poor? We've already covered that one. Do you have to provide charity care? Uh, so there's a big distinction here between can you and must you. Uh, and there's a big distinction between hospitals and clinics. First, if you're a nonprofit, you're, you're, there's a, you've got to provide some sort of tax-exempt purpose in there. It can be through education or it can be through charity care. But there's much more of an, a requirement on hospitals to provide charity care. For-profit clinics generally have absolutely no duty to provide charity care. All right, So you have to know about your federal tax exemption requirement. You have to um, either be doing uh, relief to the poor, or you can, might be able to do education and science, but you have to do one of those and you have to know about the Form 990 Schedule H. Our tax-exempt people um, are, are good on that, Jessica Manavasker, um, Steve Beck, and the like. So um, you have to do something probably if you're tax-exempt and not if you don't. Um, Medicare lets hospitals make their own determination of who's indigent, um, and then 
Medicare sets out criteria for its policies. And really, this only matters to the extent you're trying to claim write-offs as bad debt. Um, and so Medicare sets out this sort of basic principle. Um, and if you want to uh, have uh, – if, if you wanted to take bad debt as a cost on your cost report, you've got to follow the things in here. You've got to make sure um, that the, there isn't a way that you could get paid by someone else. You have to have documentation. You have to take into account the patient's total resources and the like. Um, so do you have to put patients into collection? If you're a clinic, no. If you're a hospital, yes, if you want to claim bad, the bad debt on the cost report. So it, if you don't want to claim the debt, you do not ever have to put someone into collection. If you're a hospital and you want to claim it on your cost report, then you do have to figure out, um, you basically have to provide support for the idea that your fee is real, right? Um, and for a clinic, that's, I, I worry a little bit about wink, wink, nudge, nudge discounts where you're, you're not going to charge the patient. Um, you, you know, you're sending a bill without attempting to collect it. Someone could argue that that's a fake charge and going into your whole charge analysis. But if someone is poor um, or you're worried that they're mad at you on malpractice, you can write those amounts off. And then here's the federal regulation. If you're a hospital and you want to claim stuff on your cost report, it's got to be um, for a covered service. Um, you have to show that you made a reasonable effort to collect it um, and that you used sound judgment determining that you weren't going to be able to. Can you charge interest on debts? So you've got to know both federal and state law. If you're charging interest at, at a certain level, it often becomes a truth and lending thing and you have to follow all of the credit card disclosures. I turn to our banking people for help on this. It's complicated. Um, so if you want to do this, make sure you get legal help. We can get you set up with someone on that. Um, Let's put it this way, I don't fully understand all of this stuff, but I get parts of it. You do have to worry about your state usury laws. Now, Medicare will often tell you that you can't charge interest, and they will point to this regulation, and I don't know if the client who got this letter, but it was a client in the southern part of the United States, got a letter from CMS saying, we understand you charge insurance, you're not allowed to. This was about a decade ago. And I wrote them back and I said, you are wrong, you are allowed to, and here's why I believe you're allowed to. And this is the Medicare Learning Network we were talking about earlier when I discussed how you can charge for um, missed appointments. And this is the explicit thing, and it says you can charge for lost business opportunities, and interest is, after all, a lost business opportunity for money. You know, you're not charging for a service, you're charging for a lost business opportunity. So I wrote to CMS about a decade ago and said, you're wrong, you cannot get mad at my client for having charged interest. And I am still waiting for the response to that letter. Um, and I believe the reason I have not received a response to that letter is because the letter was right. So you can charge Medicare, um, you don't have to. If you're charging, you gotta know your state law. I picked two states at random because I looked at this for the people in Georgia and in Minnesota. Um, you know, so in Minnesota, if you don't have a written agreement, you can charge up to 6%. A written agreement lets you get to 8%. Um, and if you want to go above, you need a license. Georgia, slightly different. You can go to, you know, you can see if you're below 7% uh, or below, you don't need a written agreement, but you do need one for above 8. Um, and then it's, com it's complicated. This stuff is hard. It's often for places not worth it, but something to think about. Um, and then just something to keep in mind, there are special rules for the Fair Debt Collection Act. Um, so like collecting from people, there are protections for debtors. You can't be calling them in the middle of the night. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind. I hope most of you guys farm this out, so I'm not going to focus on it. But if you're trying to collect inside, know about it. All right. Now, uh, a contest and a uh, picture, and then we will move on. So there is a song money, money, money. Uh, and uh, I'm not thinking of the money, money, money. Uh, I'm thinking of one. This is by a group that if you want to take a chance on the answer, uh, it is a four-person group, heavily blonde. Um, uh, and so that's the song I'm thinking of. All right. I was in my backyard on Monday, and I saw this. And uh, it made me think there's a news story. Apparently, a lot of people are eating junk food right now, and I understand that there is a shortage of Oreo cookies. And I think it is terrible that people are willing to eat these really cute birds in the form of a cookie. Um, but I also hear that they are increasing the manufacturing of Oreo cookies, so there will be more of them for people to eat that double stuff on. Okay, 
you can groan now. Last thing we're going to talk about, uh, and we, I will do questions at the end, and we do have an answer on our money, money, money song. Uh, uh, I'll tell you this one now, but it'll be in the, it, that's ABBA, um, which is why you could take a chance on them. All right, pricing transparency. So we got about 10 minutes left. I will go through the pricing transparency, and then I will answer the questions. So, oh, I did not mean to advance that slide. Uh, okay, so uh, there, here's a site to the rule itself, which came out uh, in November of 2019. It takes effect, in theory, January 1 of 20, uh, 2021. If you're a clinic, you can listen to this for curiosity. It doesn't apply to you. It only applies to hospitals. It applies to all hospitals. Um, there's lots of questions about whether it's ever going to come into being. I will talk about those in my last slides. It defines some terms. And this is one, the regulation is more complicated than it needs to be. Um, I get, my hair hurts when I read parts of this, but I've sort of started to learn how to simplify chunks of it. And part of why it gets complicated is, so for example, we're going to talk about minimum and maximum charges. You have to post your minimum and your maximum. Well, you also have to make available literally every a rate that an insurer pays you. Since you're doing that, why do you have to separately do the maximum and the minimum? I do not know, because if you're listing them all, the minimums and maximums are in there. But I guess it's for ease of use. But in any event, um, so you've got your de-identified maximum and minimum, which are the amount that the highest charge that a hospital has negotiated. So we're using the word charge here, but it's really a rate you're going to get paid. And this is highlighting the semantical differences between charge and uh, reimbursement. So this is what you're going to get paid, but they're using the word charge, the highest amount and lowest amount from an insurer. You're, and actually, if you're a clinic, you might want to listen to this because actually the semantic conversation is, is worth something. Um, your discount, your discounted cash price. So uh, is the um, charge that a person who pays cash, I am really going to start to have a problem speaking here, but the person who paying cash, whatever they pay, that one makes sense, right? That's the discounted cash price. Your gross charge is the amount that appears in the hospital's charge master without any reimbursement. So that's your gross charge. Then you have to put, you're going to have to put stuff together in a machine readable format. That's for the computer people. And then there's a term that's a shoppable service. And these are a list of things that CMS is putting out where people are likely to compare. So it's stuff that people think about in advance, right? So OB, people shop for OB. You don't usually shop for your uh, myocardial infarction stuff because that tends to happen quickly. So you'll shop for hips and knees. You won't shop for appendectomies. That wasn't intended to rhyme, but it sort of did. Now, a key term is the standard charge. This is how they define it. It's the regular rate by the hospital for an item or service to a specific group of paying patients. And this includes all of the following. So your standard charge is your gross charge. That's your charge master amount. Your payer specific negotiated rate. So whatever they're actually going to pay you. And your de-identified maximum and minimum and the discounted cash price. So your standard charge is five different things. That's confusing, but in a weird way, you can kind of get where it's coming for, from, right? So the regulation sets up um, you know, kind of two sets of public disclosure requirements. So you have to make available a file that has all of your standard charges, and then separately, a consumer-friendly list of your standard charges that's just for shoppable services. So the first one is literally everything. The second one is just stuff that's shoppable. All right, And it's another one where you go, well, why are, do we have these two things? If you have to list it for everyone, why the shoppable ones? And I think the reasoning is they want people, to, they figure the shoppable stuff will be easier for people to figure out. Um, and it's not going to be as overwhelming as this machine readable thing, which I guess is really going to be there for companies to come in and mine data um, and then try to sell it to people because I can't imagine patients are going to be going through those big machine readable formats, right? So there really are these two separate requirements, um, publishing your standard charge and then displaying a shoppable service list. They're related but different. Um, for the shoppable service list, instead of having a list, 
you can have an estimating tool where people can use the internet, the internet tool and type stuff in, and if it has a bucket of there are going to be 70 things that it has to include, and then there's another 230 additional ones, and I still don't really understand this part of the rule. It, I get really confused every time I read it. Um, for both of these, they have to be prominently displayed on your website and have to be accessible to the public without charge or registration. The kinds of things that you have to provide are similar for the shoppable services. Actually, it's the same really for the shoppable services and for the full list. So you have to have your gross charge both for inpatient and outpatient stuff. So basically everything is inpatient and outpatient. Your gross charge, the payer specific negotiated rate for each payer. So basically every different amount different payers pay you, holy Toledo, right? And then separately, your maximum and minimum, which is where it gets kind of redundant. You've listed them all, and then I guess if you were to just do them in order, it seems like you solved that problem, but you've got to list your maximum and minimum. So is this going to happen? Oh, I, so this, I added this slide. Part of why I'm not going into gory detail on this, there's a pretty good free resource from the government. Um, up in the slide deck links here. Uh, the email version that went out, I didn't include this in because I was dumb, so I apologize. Uh, but you can you can pull it from here, and you can uh, when when the email goes out tomorrow with the evaluation and other stuff, there'll be a link to the slides in it, um, and you can pull it off of there. So it's a pretty good CMS presentation, and it's free. Um, so is this going to happen? First reason it might not is COVID, right? People may say we're too busy and there's a delay. That is possible. It hasn't happened yet. When I saw the notice yesterday, I thought maybe it was happening. It isn't. And I don't know. I think people really like price transparency, and so I don't know if it's going to happen. But the other thing that's happening is there is a lawsuit. Um, AHLA, uh, uh, AHLA, let's try that again. Uh, the AHA, it's not the American Health Lawyers Association. So the American Hospital Association followed a lawsuit saying that this provision violates the First Amendment because it compels speech, it goes beyond the authority and the law, um, and it doesn't you know, materially advance the state interest and it's arbitrary and all that stuff. So I am generally a fan of lawsuits to challenge regulations. Well, I guess I'm, I don't know if I am or not, but I often support challenges of regulations and I often think things are overly broad. I'm not sure that this one is, that this lawsuit's gonna prevail. Um, first, the state can't speech when there's a good reason for it, and I think one could make a pretty good argument that patients should understand the mess of charges we're in. But I want to focus on the statute for a moment. So I don't remember when this passed. It's a long time ago. I want to say this might be a 10-year-old statutory provision. And it's hard to see, but look at the, um, the red S in standard charges, right? So here's the statute. Every hospital operating within the United States shall for each year make a public list of the hospital's standard charges for items and services provided by the hospital. And the reason I think that plural is so important is that it's recognizing that for each item and service, you might have more than one charge. I think this law understands that hospitals have different charges for different payers. And this also goes back to where we started, right? If you send a bill for a hundred bucks, but you think the person is going to pay 90, I kind of feel like your charge is 90. And I think this statute is saying if you, that that's your charge and you need to list that charge. And I think that that statutory authority acknowledges that you may have more than one price. Um, and so I am afraid that the AHA's lawsuit is going to fail on this. All right. Um, we're right at the top of the hour, and I've got a few questions to try to answer. Uh, and so before I do that, I'm just going to mention a couple of uh, uh, kind of close with a few observations. So uh, I started by mentioning our flat fee advice thing. If you want to be able to call us up and just ask a question like about pricing, but you're thinking, I don't want to pay an hourly rate. Um, we have worked with a bunch of clients to say, hey, for a flat amount per month, we will answer the questions you ask. Now, this obviously requires a kind of, it has to be fair on both sides, right? We can't answer an unlimited number of questions for a very small price. Um, but that said, it's worked really, really well with the clients we've tried this with. So if you're interested in that, you know, whoever your main point of contact is at Fredrickson, give them a call. You know, if you don't have one, if you want to give me a call, feel free. Uh, and we are happy to set that up. Okay, 
let's dive into the questions. So we've had several situations where a payer reimburses us less than the actual cost of a drug. Our petitions have fallen on deaf ears with the payer suggesting we find another supplier. Our drug cost is competitive with everyone else. We've explained we can't lose money on the drug and suggested that we'll refer to the patients to another provider. The payer sees this as a violation of our contract. Are we obligated to provide the drug to the pay payers insured at a loss? That's a great question. Um, I, I would say generally no, right? Um, I guess I, it, it, we'd have to look at the payer contract. I don't think contracts generally require you to provide any service. Um, and so there might be limits on who you can, I definitely have seen limitations on where you can send a patient. Um, I don't think that, and I will say candidly, I see fewer, I used to read payer agreements all the time. People don't send them to their lawyers as much anymore. Perhaps you should, but generally don't. So I don't, my universe isn't as big, but I can't say that I have seen one that says, you must provide everything to this patient. And in fact, it wouldn't make any sense, right? If you are a oncology practice, you're not going to provide orthopedic care. Um, but I haven't even seen one that says you're an oncology practice, you have to provide all oncology care. So I would think you could send the person out, and if they're saying it's a violation of the contract, I would want them to specify how. Um, can you bill the patient when there are only incidental services, um, such as supplies, that are not billable to insurance? Um, like a, in ER, a patient goes through triage but leaves without seeing a physician. Um, so this is a good question. Um, uh, I mean, if if they have insurance, um, I guess you're going to have to figure out what's up. If there's if it doesn't rise to the level, I want to punt on this one a little because I don't. I'm, I'm trying to think of exactly what's afoot here. Um, and as to why you wouldn't be billable to insurance. I'm afraid I'm not understanding that one well enough um, to provide a good answer. So on uh, discounts on patient balances after the insurance payment is received. The hospital wants to write off patient balances because due to a software failure, the statements didn't go out for 360 days. Is that appropriate and legal? Um, another good question. I remember when I had a, so I once got a bill from a hospital two years after I had been there. And I would have happily paid the bill at the time, but like we have a program where you can, you know, run your, your cafeteria plan, right? And my ability to run that through my cafeteria plan was gone. Um, and I'm like, so what bill that would have been free to me is now expensive. I am not going to pay this. And they wrote it off. Can you do that? I would say yes. And I, I my, argument here is that this is different um, than the other situation. And so this is, to me, malpractice or other business mistakes. I think if you're writing off because of a mistake you made, I think that is analytically different and it's supportable. Um, can't point to a case law to back that up, but intellectually, I would feel totally comfortable defending that. And that, um, you know, it's a, it's a patient goodwill thing. And also now someone could make an argument, hey, that's going to encourage the patient to come again. And so maybe that's a violation of, uh, you know, uh, the kickback or civil monetary penalty statute. But I don't, I don't feel like that analysis is sound. I feel like really what's going on here is we're fixing a mistake we made. Um, so that's kind of my take on it. But it's, it's not crystal clear, but that's what I do. Can a practice have a cash rate where patients opt out of taking their insurance and pay the cash rate? No claim will be sent to patients, uh, uh, sent to the insurance. Well, it still has the problem out. It, I mean, it still creates the problem, right? Um, that is definitely a charge that's out there. And for insurers that are paying you the equivalent of your billed charge, I think the problem still exists. And I think there's a giant intellectual um, there's an intellectual problem here. So I do, I do not love that. Um, one of the big issues he, with hospitals that are in network, but the ER docs are out of network resulting in surprise billing. Can you discuss? That is a big thing. Um, I've helped friends with this problem because you know, it isn't limited to ER, right? It's, it happens in surgeries. The anesthesiologists are out. Um, I I'm actually sympathetic to patients on this pickle, and I would argue that when there is a surprise bill, this is where implied contract comes into play. And I'm going to focus on a friend of mine who had gone to the doctor um, for a, an OB procedure, called and asked and was told everyone was in network, and then found out later anesthesiology wasn't and got a $2,000 bill. 
Um, and what wound up happening ultimately was a letter to the state attorney general to say, hey, this is not, this is a violation of the implied contract. And I think it is. And so I'm actually somewhat surprised on some of this surprise billing thing. I guess people often don't want to go to court over small amounts and stuff like that. But, but it, when the bill is a surprise, the person who is surprised can point to this implied contract. Um, and so to me, if people are out of network, if you are an out of network professional providing services to patients, I would figure out a way to make sure you're communicating to patients what's going to happen because I think their surprise gives them a defense for not paying that bill. All right, and we're just about out of time, but I will I see one last question here and I will do it. And I, um, I guess I will mention, you, for those of you who stuck around and you're saying, gosh, I should have gone to the top of the hour. Remember, all of our webinars are available for free. So for example, if you wanna make someone suffer through listening to this, um, when you get the link tomorrow, that you can send it to them. And our past webinars are out there uh, for free. If you're looking for the CLE credit, um, the information about that, or CLE or also HCCA, will be in the email tomorrow. So uh, I'm a lab that wants to have a different charge or fee uh, for tests that are based on location of the physician who referred the tests. Any concerns? I think that's a way more logical and defensible approach. Um, you know, I, geographic variability exists in the Medicare program and the like. Um, I'm, I'm much less worried about about that. And it isn't all price variation is always illegal. It, you want to have a reason for it, right? Um, and one of the reasons you might have a different prices is different cost. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Well, gang, I do want to thank you all for, for listening. Um, uh, please do fill out our survey. We, we read it. Uh, in fact, the reason we're doing HIPAA next week is that the most common request for topics uh, is HIPAA oriented. Um, and so we do try to pay attention to what people want as future topics and the like. And so in the interest of giving, uh, meeting the need, I think we're going to do hip, uh, a tr free HIPAA training for people next month. If there's another big COVID thing, we will do an update then. And uh, in the meantime, I hope everyone is able to stay well and stay sane. And if you're looking for flat fee information, give us a buzz. Thanks. Have a good day.